the leper scholar versus Israel in Isaiah 53, exaltation. The belief that Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people as the man Israel that is often attributed to Rashi is now the prevalent teaching on the subject. Jews for Judaism is one of the most followed on the internet in its analysis of Isaiah 53 being the people Israel. The following is from Jews for Judaism, Isaiah 53, verse by verse. There's been no change to, to anything. This is directly from their internet site, which they allow you to download. They authorize the use of this material. If you're not authorized, if, if someone doesn't say share this or download this, take this, in some manner, authorizing you to take it. You are not to take information from people's websites. But having this authority to take it, the only thing I have to worry about is slander and perjury, and that is not something I would do. I'm a lawyer, very familiar with these things. And this is in quotes. 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall succeed. He will be exalted and become high and exceedingly lofty. The success and exaltation of God's servant is an event that the prophet sees as futuristic. This is Jews for Judaism, and, and that particular uh, verse 12 is different than the one that's used in the Jewish Publication Society's 1985 edition of the translation of Hebrew to English of the Hebrew Bible. I'm not sure where they where, where it comes from. Continuing on with this writing, the immediate context, chapter 52, verses 7 through 12, tells us that this is part of the blessing that Israel will experience at the time of her restoration. This is my commentary on that. In Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15, a multiple verse quotation, starting at 13, ending at 15, the verses are combined. The Lord begins to describe his righteous servant of chapter 53. Isaiah 52, 13 through 15 should have been verses 1 through 3 of chapter 53. My servant to be exalted and become high and exceedingly lawfully is now the Gentile man God comes with from Adam, a Christian country, and of the Jewish people none are with him. It is not the exiles. It is the Gentile that becomes my righteous servant in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 11 after passing the test of devotion in Isaiah 53, verse 10. When he makes himself an offering for guilt in a covenant with God. The immediate context of Isaiah 52, verses 7 through 12 is poetry and an announcement of prophecy fulfilled in the return to Judah of all 13 tribes a remnant of each tribe who had been deported in exile to Assyria, Babylon at one time or another. My servant, exalted, was the Assyrian Babylonian exiles and the victory, this is, this is from verses 7 through 12, and the victory in sight of all the nations was the second temple. It was not a futuristic prophecy. The return included God's forgiveness of all of the sins and inequities of the Assyrian Babylon exiles. <clears throat> Jeremiah's time to come of the new covenant with sin forgiveness in the day of the Lord is for the Roman dispersal, the diaspora, which means outside of the promised land outside of Israel. 
and is futuristic. The translation of Art Scroll and Shabbat of Isaiah 52 that Rashi comments on does not include the quotations that combine verses 13 through 15. The translation used by Jews for Judaism for its commentary also does not have the quotations. They are the only verse quotations of Isaiah 52 and a demarcation of the verses of the fulfillment of prophecy by the return of the remnant of the 13 tribes from exile. They are the beginning, verses 13 through 15, of the description of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 and had nothing to do with the exiles. Prophecy fulfilled. That's what chapter 52 is, and it ends in verse 12. God's servant has nothing to do with the exiles. God's servant is what he always calls them, my servant, my servant. And after chapter 53, he doesn't start calling them my righteous servant. That hasn't changed after Isaiah 53. It's the only time he ever uses the term. God's righteous servant is a Gentile in the beginning. The translation of the Jewish Publication Society has the quotations. This is their rendition. Indeed, my servant shall prosper, be exalted, and raised to great heights. Verse 14, just as the many were appalled at him, so marred was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. Verse 15, just so he shall startle many nations, kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. My servant is now the Gentile and not the exiles who becomes my righteous servant in Isaiah 53, 11, after passing the test of a devotion in Isaiah 53, 10, when he makes himself an offering for guilt in a covenant with God. Isaiah 53 then begins with a new multiple verse quotation that is missing the quotes from the translation of Art Scroll, Shabbat, and Jews for Judaism. But again, it's, they are included in the translation of the Jewish Publication Society. And what's interesting about their rendition is they started from scratch. A complete new translation begun in 1955. Involved were Orthodox rabbi, a Orthodox rabbi, conservative, and reform, along with uh, specialists in linguistics, professors, scholars from universities. It spent it would look uh, 55, and it's it's uh, went to print in 85. So some 30 years of working on this language, and and they 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 use the oldest Hebrew Bible that we have around 1100, I think it is. It's called the Leningrad Codex. And they just they just took it out, started on the first page. Now all these other renditions are generally, are generally a uh, translation that began with the Leningrad Codex, but went through several different translators, making different changes. And of course, when this was done, Hebrew had been adopted by the state of Israel, uh, I would suppose in 1948 when Israel was created <clears throat> after the Holocaust. So they, they had a good background, you know. Uh, here, here's how they read. Who can believe what we have heard? Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he has grown by his favor like a tree kind like a tree trunk out of arid ground. He had no form or beauty, that we should look at him no charm, that we should find him pleasing. He was despised, shunned by men, a man of suffering, familiar with disease, as one who hid his face from us. 
He was despised. We healed him of no account. Yet, it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. We accounted him plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. Verse 5, but he was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our iniquities. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we were healed. Verse 6, we all went astray like sheep, each going his own way, and the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. Verse 10, God chose to crush him with disease that if he would offer himself for guilt, he might receive long life and see his children. For a purpose of God that might prosper. And here they're saying the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. In verse 10, God crushes him on cancer basically to make him offer himself for guilt and he's exposed to death in verse 11 or 12 no it's in verse 12 he's exposed to death so this is a cancer uh, the Christian rendition says he's brought to grief by illness well you know if you're brought to grief and you're exposed to death, it's going to be something like cancer. The speaker is no longer God in verses 1, one through 6. It's no longer God from the Isaiah 52 multiple verse quote, but is the witnesses of God's righteous servant of the Isaiah 53 multiple quote verse that follows. The witnesses who are Jews identify themselves as ones of the many made righteous by God's righteous servants, saying, it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering he endured. He was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our inequities. That's verse 5. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. That's, that's also verse 5. And the Lord visited upon him the guilt of us all. That's verse 6 and see offering for guilt in uh, verse 10. That's just bringing out all these words of, of being punished. The quotes beginning at verse 1 and ending at, after verse 6 identify the speaker of verses 1 and 2 and three, as also being witnesses made righteous by the righteous servant from the suffering he endured, that they speak of. God's teaching is that no man bears the suffering of others. It is not even possible to bear the sins, wounds, chastisement, bruising, sickness, and suffering of others. No one or others can be healed or atoned for because Another man or men suffer or are beaten or murdered or sacrificed. So what are these verses by the witnesses about? The sickness of the witnesses is not being righteous. That's what the whole story, it's not a song, it's what the story of Isaiah 53 is. You'll see the Jews for Judaism says these are kings of the nations of the Gentiles. You can think of them, since they're supposedly the leaders, that's the Gentiles he's talking about are the witnesses. This is about a man who God specifically crushes with disease, brings him down low to make him offer himself for the guilt, which is an emotion of the Jewish people that they feel for violating his laws, commandments, and rules. That's the sickness. It makes you sick to your stomach when you realize you're not doing well in God's ways. All the problems you have in your family, with your children, with your boss, everything, if you're sinful, if you're not following the commandments God gave you to live your life as 
in the best way possible in this harsh world. And he knows that. Those commandments are for us. Do not. It's just his way of saying, I understand the world's harsh. I have a purpose for it. It's perfect. It's exactly what I want. So, it's, it's God's righteous servant. It's, it's the servant, the Gentile, who suffers by this chastisement, punishment, bruising, crushing, maltreatment, laid on him by the words and power of God. It's not the world that does this. It's not man. It wasn't the Romans. For Jews, for Judaism, it's, 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 it's not the, uh, the way the Gentiles treated you and what you were put through with all the pogroms and the Holocaust etc etc <laughs> a purpose and, and uh, by God's power to make him suitable for his purpose that might prosper now this purpose that includes his righteous servant making the many righteous well that's the task of the righteous servant that's not what God's purpose is to make everybody righteous no He's trying to draw people to his prophet, to know who he is by his teachings. That God is with him as he was with Moses. Because as people come to believe who the Moshiach is, who is the man described in Isaiah 53 from chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, that the Spirit of God alights upon, according to the sages and rabbis and the Talmud, until, of course, Rashi, much later than the Talmud. And today it's uh, Outreach Judaism and Jews for Judaism that, that I see prevalent. I don't know that all rabbis aren't like Mamanis, Rambam, who said, uh, Rashi's wrong. He's just flat wrong. It's too inconsistent. It doesn't fit. And Rashi, as I point out in another video, and I believe it gets pointed out in this video, uh, is apparently known for inconsistencies. I, I really can't comment on that. Other than I, I have one inconsistency that I'm, I'm talking about. But we find out what that purpose is in Malachi 3. That's the last chapter, the last time God speaks to, to a prophet. That's, they say, uh, and God stopped talking to his prophets, the Bible closes. And that's Malachi 3. And that's the day of his prophetic announcement of a day of the Lord. Now, day of the Lord, it, it shows up in about seven different other uh, books. And uh, it's, it's generally thought of. And the Essenes of the Dead Sea Scrolls also thought this, and they were big followers of Isaiah, that the day of the Lord was a time when there would be a removal of evil and sinfulness in the world. And everybody would get along. The Essenes, who again wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, they, they believed it was it was right upon them. And their their founder, his very name, is the teacher of righteousness. That's Isaiah fifty three. That's what they say about Jesus. He's the teacher of righteousness. Makes the many righteous by his knowledge. Not by his death. That's not what 53 says. But in Malachi 3, God again addresses the day of the Lord. They're, they're all kind of different. There's some uh, renditions or some chapters that, that the day of the Lord is uh, only as to Christianity, a dominant son, or it's against the nations, or it's against the nations, all Gentiles, and Israel. Uh, it just differs. But Malachi 3 gives us a complete new outlook. And it's God's final words on the subject. Again, the writings in antiquity were oftentimes just for those people. They, they look like prophecy. But they can't happen in the real world. If it can't happen in the real world, it's not prophecy. God has another purpose. It can be anything from from uplifting those people in a harsh time who couldn't read, a society of ignorance, people basing their, 
their, their entire uh, life and relationship with other people just on emotion. And you know how bad that can be if you act just on emotion without thinking. So, and for religious purposes, just creating religion and even knowing what the Gentiles were going to do with Christianity, God knows all things from beginning to end, causing some controversy, making it interesting for God. And, and of course, there is prophecy, there is prophecy that can happen in the real world. And that's what the day of the Lord is about. In the day of the Lord, and we know it's here, and I'll get to that in a moment. We know it's here. It's very simple. Uh, I've heard Jews for Judaism, and Michael Skoback say, it's when, it, it, it's when we all stop sinning. God will come back. Or I guess he means as many as we can get that are possible. That's, that's, not, that's not in the, the scripture. There's nothing in the scripture that says when, the, when all of the Jewish people together as the man Israel, and they're supposed to be all together. That, that whole concept came at when they all gathered at Horb and God made the covenant with them. That was 100% of the Jewish people. And they had to agree to a man to accept the teachings God gives Moses. And then to them. 100% and you do exactly what he says. And of course there's a lot of vagueness in a lot of these commandments. And the oral tradition started like it says, you know, you will celebrate Shabbat. Well, how? You know, those kind of things. And an oral tradition occurred. And then finally, uh, it was decided, we, we got to write all these down. There's everybody out there, all rabbis, anybody that knows stories, write them down. And that's what created the Talmud. God knew that's exactly what would happen by leaving his commandments and laws and rules and teachings so vague. In, in many places. And he knew that they were going to associate the Dom with the Saw, and the Saw is the brother of Jacob, who God renamed Israel, eternal antagonists, almost enemies. And that's how this whole thing developed that Adam was considered Rome, then Christian Rome. Rome fell, and today it's Christianity, a reference to Adam and Saw. So we find out what the purpose is in Malachi. First verse, God says, I'm sending my messenger to clear the way before me. Meaning he already knows there's not going to be a temple. That one's going to have to be built. He already knows. Because he comes with a covenant of friendship that says, I'm going to place my sanctuary amongst you. He knows it's not there. He knew the, of the Roman dispersal. He knew Rome was going to destroy it. Isaiah writes sin forgiveness for the exiles of the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom that return, all 13 tribes. And Jeremiah writes for the return of the dispersal of Rome, the diaspora, and sin forgiveness is a part of it. The purpose of God is to return to his temple. He says, I'm sending him to clear my message, to clear the way before me, and I shall return to my temple suddenly, when it's rebuilt. But he has to come before that because he's got to get a man ready. He's got to have a, a Moses. He's got to have a representative. He's got a man who speaks his words, writes his words, and that he can speak through. They said Moses was his veritable mouthpiece on earth. And that man is described in Isaiah 53. That's what the description is for. Even the sages knew you had to have a description. They see chapter 11, a descendant of David is going to come. And they've only got one description. And they say, well, that sure doesn't look like King David, this man of suffering, familiar with disease that is shunned and despised. Accounted plagued and afflicted by God. That doesn't sound like him, but that's got to be him. And that's exactly what they had written. And that's what's in the Talmud. And that, of course, is what Rashi disagreed with. He said, no. I don't know his reasoning behind it or anything. 
I, you know, I, I haven't studied Rashi that much. I know he's a great scholar, dearly beloved, and uh, and thought of and thought of very highly. Uh, I've read everything he has on his commentary on 53 and several other chapters, just to well, like Malachi. But see, then I see that you can't you can't just go with everything somebody says in antiquity, no matter how smart they are, because they only had so much knowledge. You know, we're of the age of enlightenment. Reason, knowledge, medicine, science, information, and now the internet. That, not so. Not so in antiquity. For instance, verse 1 concludes with, The angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. And there's, that always perplexed me. But I finally, when God was having me type Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord, I have two books that he dictated to me, unpublished. Uh, for some reason, Jewish publishers are shying away from it. Matter of fact, everybody's been shying away from it. But that's where God wrote in, shunned and despised. A kind of play, it's like, you know, uh, <laughs> we pray for Moshiach, but when he shows up, they shun him and despise him. And yes, they do. Yes, they do. That, that, part's, that part's taken care of. A lot of it's taken care of my, well, we'll get to that. So that's his purpose. Let's go to Jeremiah. See a time is coming. He says it three times. One, see a time is coming, and then there's several verses that follow, all the way to 31. See a time is coming again. And then it, uh, the, it, it skips some verses, and then the last verse is see a time is coming. Okay, here's, what they, here's basically what it says. See a time is coming. The Jewish people return. Why? Because the land blooms again. From desolation and ruins. You know, see, see uh, uh, chapter 61. Desolation and ruin. Well, Mark Twain went there in the late 1800s and said it's nothing but desolation. Nothing standing. Well, after 1948, if you go look at Israel today, it blooms again. That's how I sum up that whole paragraph. There's a lot of different, you know, great scripture in it. Great verses. <clears throat> now, the last verse, it says, See, the time is coming. Jerusalem shall be rebuilt from here to there and there and here. Biblical markers. And uh, there's no question, it's, mo it, it's almost in impossible to identify them. But you can get enough to know that Jerusalem today is far, far larger and greater than Jerusalem of antiquity. It's a great metropolitan area now. So there it is. See a time is coming, land blooms again. See a time is coming. The ruined cities are restored and Jerusalem is rebuilt. And that's simply the Jews have returned. God says, well, when y'all return, I'll come back. That's all it is. He doesn't say everybody's got to be sinless. He doesn't say everybody's got to perform a certain amount of mitzvahs or anything else. He says, I know, I, I believe me, I know y'all. You, you, I know you like the back of my hand. I know there's always going to be sinners above, uh, among you. I know, he tells us in Malachi, that many of you will never heed me. You know, and that's with the covenant of sin forgiveness at hand. And he's saying, I know. But you, but you know, when I, gave the, when I made the announcement that I was going to forgive your sins and that that would cause Torah written on your heart and everyone would heed me, that's what you would expect. But we know better. The reality is, no. And that's why he makes a scroll of remembrance for this day. This day of the Lord. It's to put in there those who he revere and esteem his name. The word he's not in Malachi, but esteeming his and revering his name includes heeding. <clears throat> How is Torah written on your heart? A metaphor? 